What we want to do in this rehearsal is take, we may allow some questioning and answering, but we're going to primarily take music questions and primarily technical questions and functional questions. You know, like rehearsal questions, because a lot of times we're finding out as we go, we just, matter of fact, I just did a video that will be coming out in the, in probably August or September, it's called, we have a, we have a four video set called Conversations with a Worship Leader, and we did a follow-up called Conversations with a Worship Band, and it's this worship band, and we just answer a lot of questions about technical playing, just because it seems that churches have moved to a more contemporary style, and some of them have great players, some of them have bad players. And what we're trying to do is give you tools to make really bad players tolerable. And decent players really good. And most of all, help everybody understand that the less you do, the better it sounds. That way everybody's not fighting one another, okay? So what we'll do is we'll probably start with taking a couple of grooves apart uh, of songs you would know that we sing and uh, and we want to open like for questions but I don't want to get too bogged down in questions but make sure you they're short and make sure they are concerning a technical aspect on drums is Scott Williamson and that's him back there and uh, we have a couple of we have drummers here in the church we have three that we use predominantly which is Justin was Justin here Where's Justin? Pull him out here. Is Cliff here? Is he here? Where are you, Cliff? I don't see you. Walk out here where everybody can see you. This is Cliff Castleman. Where are you at, Cliff? I can't see you yet. Come out here, brother. There you go. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Wave at everybody. That's Cliff. Is Justin there? Come on, don't mess with me, boys. Get out of here. We also have our pastor's son. When y'all get him in tow, let me know. Uh, pa our pastor's son, Scott Kilpatrick, plays drums for us. Benny is our primary bass player, but we also have a couple of young guys. Who's in your band? Chris, is he here? Are you here, Chris? We have several, there's Justin. Justin, wave at us. Come here, Cliff and Justin, come here a minute. Don't they look cute in their shorts? Um, this, is, this is Justin, this is Cliff, and, and, and I see you back there, Mr. Lee. You come out here too, Greg. These guys, the reason I want you to see them uh, is Charlie here? Is Charlie Goddard here? Did he leave? He'll, he'll be back in five minutes. He's, he's got a dark, dark hair. He plays guitar. And who's this other guy right here that plays guitar? Let's stand up right there. You two guitar players. There's another one. There's both of them. Now, I don't know. You guys have probably played a while. Have you been playing a while? So you didn't play before revival either. And Mike Motley who is my assistant and an awesome worship leader, did not play or lead worship before revival started. These guys didn't play drums. Uh, Greg didn't play keyboards. You'll hear from, I'm probably going to get these guys behind the drums tonight at some point. I want you to hear them. God bless you guys. I didn't mean to embarrass you. I just wanted to brag on you. Um, am I leaving somebody out, Benny? I don't want to get in trouble. I'm good at that, leaving someone out. Where's Charlie? Charlie, stand up. Charlie's a guitar player. Charlie, did you play before revival started? He didn't. Okay. These are all whom God has given me. And the thing about it is, is, with the exception of two, these are not imports that have come with revival. It's, you know, they're not Browns Revival School of Ministry imports. We have an import situation where the revival, that was my wife. Um, 
we have a situation with the revival where we have imports coming in all the time from all over the world and we get some good talent that way but the people that I have introduced to you here are the people who are, who are out of our church this is out of Brownsville proper now let me tell you something I've done that I would recommend and Scott and Glenn will appreciate that now that's Glenn back there on the guitar Glenn Pierce now to make things clear for you Glenn and Scott are money players. <laughs> they are professional musicians is what I mean. They are actually living in Nashville and they play on a lot of the Christian records you would hear and know. Uh, Glenn plays with Promise Keepers. Scott, do you play with Promise Keepers ever? You don't do Promise Keepers, but Scott is a producer. He, he and his sisters have a group called Three, Three Strand. You might see that in your Christian bookstore. That's Scott. And you would wonder if I got great musicians, why would I bring in great musicians for a conference like this? Number one, I have young drummers. Last night, young drummers tire out for three and a half hours. The other thing is, is this cross-pollinating is very important to me. And I want to just give honor to Scott and Glenn and Benny and, and Bill and Sarah who have come in here and, and also a man who's not here named Steve Brewster. It has cost us, because these guys make their living playing music and we pay them to bring them in for certain things. But what we do is we use them, you see. We use them to allow our young musicians to sit and listen and be instructed by and I had an agreement up the beginning of revival with Scott Steve Brewster the first time he came in for revival Glenn I said guys if you're coming I don't know if I did that with you Glenn but I know I did with the drummers but I said if you're coming in here I don't want you to come in and do a gig I want you to come in. I knew these brothers believe in the Lord. I know they follow Jesus. They love the Lord and they're worshipers. But I want you to come in here and instruct my musicians. I'm investing in my musicians by bringing these guys in. Now, my drummers back there are real close to being able to hold together a whole evening like this. They're awesome. But their stamina is not as, their stamina is not as, as, I mean, I'm just being honest. They don't have, they can't keep going. And Scott and these guys who play for a living, that's what they do. And they know how to just keep going and going and going and going. And, and the thing about Charlie on guitar, I've noticed that Charlie will take things that Glenn does and try to emulate his sounds and try to emulate some of his playing. Now somebody said, well, he's a, he's a Glenn clone. No, he's not. He will develop as he goes but when you start you have to you have to really follow after someone you like it's again that following like leadership and Glenn has come in here and, and and the beauty of Glenn is that he has a humility about himself that he just plays he doesn't showboat he's not here to be seen matter of fact you kind of have to look for him because he's always back there hidden somewhere and uh, one of his most hated sentences is when, when we're doing a video when the cameraman says, could you ham it up a little bit? You know, and Glenn just does. He ain't going to move much. So just, I don't think he ever breaks a sweat. But, but he has poured into Charlie and he's poured into these guys from the school. So it's, I want to recommend to you, if you have it in your budget, some of you don't, you're from small churches, but if you can ever get an opportunity to let these guys come in, they'll do it. They'll come in and they will help. They will help bring your, your musicians will never get better unless they play with someone better than themselves. And if you're in a situation where there is no one better than you, then just go get a drum machine with a good click on it and that will pretty well straighten you out. Because that's the most cruel time keeper. I hate click, clicks and drum machines because they hold me back. <laughs> Scott says that's what they're supposed to do. But you, you can, I grew up in a small church, a small town where there weren't any musicians. And so I really had to go get a drum machine because nobody played good drums. And I knew that I would never learn to play good timing if I didn't play with good drummers. So I had to kind of create my own environment. Uh, but what we want to do is take part, 
a couple of grooves for you, and the singers are going to take these apart for you. And Lisa, where are you? You got a stool out here for you, too. We want you to feel real special. Let's take, a, uh, let's take apart uh, the groove of, of, say, More of Your Glory. How many know the song? Okay, it's kind of old hat. You may already know it. But, uh, but I, what I want you to do is just understand what everybody's doing so that you can, uh, so you can see how silly it is. The tendency that keyboard players have is to overplay. And our problem here, and not a problem, but the asset we have is we have three keyboard players. We got Mike over there, who also plays organ, who also plays this and leads worship. We have Bill, and you notice we all switch out. We just play whatever's available. But Bill works at the school most of the time, and a lot of times he's not here. In a lot of the meetings, he can't be in two places at one time. So it's me and Mike, and sometimes other people like Greg will fill in in different places. So it's very important that we construct a mindset that when I look around and there are two other keyboard players and there's a bass player and there's a guitar player, I probably don't need to play too much. And my tempo is really not good uh, when I'm leading worship. It's not much good when I'm not, but when I'm really not leading worship, I can really... And a, a lot of times if you have a, a person who has learned to play piano, like a lot of churches have, and they've learned to play by reading, and they've gone through the John W. Shaw books and all that stuff, and they've learned all the bass, chord, chord, bass, chord, chord, bass, chord, chord. I mean, they, they're used to do it. I mean, when you're doing that, you're doing everything. That is piano virtuoso. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're doing the whole thing. And you should do that if you don't have anybody else playing with you. You know, if I were going to play more of your glory and I was it, I would play. If I can remember it. I'd, I'd do all that because I'm just it. Okay? But if I play it with the band, it will be more like... I'll play the intro, but then when we get into the groove, it'll be like... I'll do the intro. I'll do the intro full blown. And when we get to the chorus, I go... More of your glory, more of your power, more of your spirit in me. And those are real hard chords. It's like B flat F C D minor. Manifest your B flat in my F. I mean, it's just. Okay, now hear the band doing that. Okay, two, three. Here I come to sing it. More of your glory. Look, Ma, no hands. More of your power. Because they're doing the work, you see? And here's how bad it sounds if I if I try playing too much. It's not needed. You know what I mean? Because the drummer and the bass player are carrying all that. They're carrying the whole weight of that groove. Matter of fact, oh, they don't even need me most of the time. Do you see what I'm saying? All right? Now, let's see. Let's get an idea. Bill, what is your big part in that when we're playing the chorus? I heard the organ, and I just wondered how difficult what you're playing is. Uh, he can't hear me? Can you hear me now? No. Oh. You know, it's all about me. <laughs> it was better after I could hear you. <laughs> I'm just doing like a simple lead line in the intro. Just kind of, again, not being rhythmic, but just kind of maybe adding a, a melodic uh, line in there. And then when you get to the verse, I, I just drop out. <laughs> just praise the Lord. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right, let's, let's, let's go. To, and then there's some more things that happen in the little bridge part that has a little bit more. What are you doing, Glenn? 
Back on the chorus. Well, I, I'll take a listen to what's going on first before I play anything. So when I see uh, chordal instruments going on, I'll just go to a single note line, something. Like this? Like this. I can do that. Yeah, that's uh And that's all you're doing. It's easy. Mike. I'm just not sure why we brought him down here. I... <laughs> wait, wait, I, I can play some harder stuff. Uh, uh, give me give me a chance, I'll come up with something. <laughs> that's my money's worth there. There you go. Again, if he starts doing that, then I don't need to do this. Do you see what I mean? So somebody's got to decide in rehearsal who's going to carry it. It's either going to have to be carried with the keyboards or carried with the guitar. When both try carrying it, play what you were just playing, and, le and let me play what I'm playing just to keep... You see, you hear how it's just kind of... Because we're both doing the same thing. And the other thing that church bands do, we're so bad about, is dynamically we start right here and we just stay right across. More of your glory, more of your power, more of your spirit in me. Speak to my heart and change my life. Come on, come on, come on. And advance yourself in. Lift it up, lift it up, lift it up. It's been a long time. Oh, hallelujah. It has, it has. Since you stayed on my mind. I need you, I need you. Oh, my God, help me. <laughs> Anybody guilty? And by the time you're done, you're just worn out. And the people are confused. Let it have dynamic. Let it breathe. Let's play a verse section of that same tune. Um, do a chorus and then a verse. Two, three, and. More of your glory. More of your power. More of your spirit in me. Speak to my heart and change my life. Manifest yourself in me first. Oh, notice how everything just kind of stopped. And I'm listening to the guitar player to see if he's going to fill. And if he's filling in the holes, I don't play anything. I also don't remember the song. Build back to the court. More of your glory. More of your power. More of your spirit. And the sopranos are singing. even broader it slays back even more because you want to build some tension you see and the singers are singing unison we're building now do the second level out of unison this is the second level and it's bills on it's not full on now hold back Send your glory, Lord. Send your glory. Send your power. Send your power. Send your spirit. Send your spirit. Now here's the high one. Come and change me. Now we go forward. Spirit! 
to the first one, everybody. Now you see how different? And the vocals changed through those three sections. We did the bridge, but we did it three sections. It's sing your glory, sing your power, sing your spirit, come and change me. The first time they're singing unison. The second time they go to parts, a low part, which is, can y'all pull that out real quick? Sing your glory. The low one. Sing your glory. Here we go. Send your power. Send your power. It's low parts. Send your spirit. Send your spirit. Come and change me. Come Can we do the high one? Send your glory. Send your glory. So all we did is flip the parts. So suddenly the alto part went to the old tenor part, the tenor went to the old alto part, and the soprano, don't know where they went. No, they, Lisa, you have anything to say about anything? Of and unison is okay if you can't if you have people who can't sing parts there's nothing wrong with unison you know that's what everybody in the audience is singing now let's listen musically to what kind of happens because I'm going to talk in a minute about it creating an, an atmosphere see music is a tool to worship and what we're wanting to do is create emotional and an emotional field that creates what we're saying and what you're singing lyrically needs to go with what you're playing musically. They need to correlate. And if they don't, correlate. If they don't, then what you wind up with is something that's disjointed. You see what I'm saying? Because I want, when, when I come into that section of send your glory, I want it to be a reverent time where my spirit is crying out. Then I want to lift the people where they'll come out and yell with me to God, shout to the Lord, send your glory. Send your power. So we go into the section and where we've all been playing kind of rhythmically and, and kind of with a lot of rhythm, we're coming down to the, the top of the bridge. Two, three. Send your glory. Send your glory. All right. And the organ is doing this. Just drums and organ. Here we go. Just drums and organ. That makes me feel something. And the guitar is doing this. And you put them together. And then Mike is doing this. Where you at, Mike? Turn Mike up. He's just got a string pad. And see, I'm just playing chords. Is that simple enough? Grandma Mabel can even do that. Now let's move it up to the second half of that bridge where it's a little bit more. Here we go. Not all the way, but a little more. See your glory. I start playing a little more rhythm. The drums do. Everybody else kind of stays the same. And then we go full on. This is the big one. Everybody changes and comes alive. All right. Just me and the drummer. Just me and the drummer. Here we go. I'm playing this. Just me and the drummer, two, three, and... See, I start playing a lot more when I want to accentuate an issue. But the rest of the time, I'm laid way back. Okay? Now, for some of you, this is fundamental, and you're way above it. 
but just forbear those that are like the rest of us that are having little light bulbs go off and are going, oh, because you can get, you get too many people vying for the same bandwidth of, of sound. You got a piano and an organ and a keyboard player and a guitar player and we're all fighting. We're all fighting for this bandwidth. And the more we all play, the more conf confused it gets. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, it's Lisa. You could, uh, you guys could address too the blend of the vocal singers too, because that's another thing they have to focus on. Because sometimes there's a couple of them over here that get a little beside themselves worshiping, and and they want to yell a lot. And I don't mind that in certain settings, but there are other times if they're yelling, their part ain't being sang. You know what I'm saying? And so it's about blending. And a lot of times we use a lot of air instead of. I'm doing the vocal stuff. You come do the vocal stuff. That's your thing, Lise. Lisa's quite a keyboard player, too. She, she's scary. We continue to do the on tape. We want them on a microphone, so maybe... I don't know how you want to do that. Okay. Way. I can repeat it. The question is, is how do you get the, the sound person or whatever to pull those particular things out and blend them together to keep them from sounding like they're sticking out or they're abrasive? And in all fairness, your sound person has got to be a musician. Uh, you can't just find Joe Blow and say, oh, you ain't got nothing to do in a church. Well, you were ushering? Oh, praise God. Well, let's get, make you the sound guy. Yeah, that's what we need. Oh, Joe Blow over there, he's a good usher and he's an old military man. I think he could, he ain't got nothing to do on Sunday morning. Let's get, all you got to do is turn it up and down. Well, shoot, can't you just set it and leave it? We had it sounded good one service. Can't we just leave it? <laughs> you can if every single person that was there that service comes and sits back in the exact same spot. Thank you, Brother Bill. It's like Brother Bill. We'd be in trouble if that man were behind the sound console. <laughs> but because he's working in his gifting, he's the best, one of the best we have. We love Bill Bush. But you see, it's all about work. But uh, the other thing, too, and this is a friendship thing with you and the pastor and the leadership of the church. I know there's a great chasm uh, between what people deem important. One of the biggest shockers I find with church boards, I was at a church the other day, and they said, we're putting a new sound system in. I said, great. How much you spend for your building? We spent $3 million. How much you spending for your sound system? 50000 Hello. Something's wrong with this picture. Your building isn't any good if people can't hear. The way we are doing church now is electric. And if the sound is not good, you can rehearse and preach and pray all you want to. If people can't hear you, you're in a heap of trouble. And, and it's, it's kind of, we need to reverse that trend a little bit and realize that pastors and church boards and people in charge of the money need to understand, A, it costs a lot of money. B, no, you will never stop spending on it. It is a black hole to throw money down. The thing, it's just the way it is. It's like, you know, it's like your car. You wear it out, you got to get another one. It's the same with mics and cables and boards. And it's not that you get tired of one. It's just that they wear out and, and they just need to be replaced. And I, I wish there were an easy way around it. I'd love it. It'd make my job easier. You know, and your, your defense as well, um, and when you're asking a question like, the vocals are doing something, or what did the vocals do, or how does the sound man do, when, as much as we can rehearse, which is not a lot, Lindell's real specific with the vocals about what he wants them to do, when he wants them to sing, and even more often, when he does not want them to sing. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but what happens is we never really have a lot of sound checks or rehearsals, but because they do the same thing once we've kind of got the song in the can, then the sound man, um, hopefully, 
Nolan, you can attest to this, maybe I'm not. <laughs> But we'll know, oh, this is going to be a time when the singers need to come back a little bit or the singers that are actually, they're actually doing something that's worth hearing or Johnny's going to have a solo or Hazel's going to come out there. So the songs have an arrangement. It's not just we kind of sing three parts on all the songs all the time. So that helps your sound person to know that it's not everybody up all the time. So right. if you're specific as a vocal leader about when you're doing something and have a little bit of variety, then it gives you some place to kind of go. So there's a little bit more of an ebb and flow. And your sound man needs to be in on that. And he needs to also learn the timbre of each voice he's working with. Like Johnny has got the most wonderful belting voice of any of ever. I mean, the boy could cut through steel. But yet when he's singing a part, he doesn't cut through. Now Lori, on the other hand, she can cut through brick walls, and no matter how far you mix her down, she's all, you're ever-present. You're just like the Holy Ghost. She has a wonderful voice, but you can always find it, even though she's blending. So the sound man has to be aware that Lori is going to need to be blended, while Hazel, we're lucky if we can hear her. So because her voice timbre, and then the other lady who sings tenor, Carolyn is another one. She has a timbre. It's not a bad timbre. It's just the way her voice is built that she can cut through. It's like certain people's voices can cut through. My wife's is another one. She can hide so well. And you have to learn. And, and Mary, who sings tenor, we have a female, la uh, female lady, like there's something else, you know. Uh, she sings tenor. And because she's a female and she's singing tenor, it's kind of low. And her voice is kind of, kind of has a, a thing to it, lots of air. Richard, the black guy who sings on the end down there, that's the only reason I call him up not being racist or anything. We, he does look a little different than the rest of us. <laughs> Brother Richard has got, he's got another one of those kind of voices, you know. And, and it's real, yeah, it's real silky and... And, you know, it's kind of Luther Vandross, you know, kind of, ooh, and, you know, I mean, I love when he does a solo, but if I really want to put something across, don't give it to Richard because that's not his voice style. That's not going to fit him. However, if you want it to cut through and it's one of those romp and stompers, then you give it to somebody's voice who can cut through with it. But when you're singing on a line like this, the sound man needs to know who's going to cut through, who's not. And, he, you know, just kind of pull them back, EQ them properly. And that doesn't mean because Lori and Carol's voice has more cut, cutting ability that you turn them out of the mix because we need their part. It just means you blend them. And uh, that's why your music, your, your sound guy has got to have a musical ear. And it doesn't matter if he plays an instrument, he's just got to know how to listen to music. My wife would make a great sound person because she knows how to listen to music. When she's listening to music, she's listening to everything. She'll hear things that I don't hear. She'll go, what's that little sound? Is that a keyboard that's going? And I won't even notice it. But it's back there in the back creating a, a bed that I don't even hear it. And that's the kind of person you need back there. Now, if you're working in a church with 60 people and the usher, usher Bob is all you've got, then just go with usher Bob. But during the rehearsal, try to figure a way to get back there and tell him exactly what you want. Another thing that's really nice, uh, we've got awesome sound people here. And, you know, Benny is kind of in charge of that. Nolan is, is like incredible professional sound guy, tech. Dace back there, wave at us, Dace. Days helps, and we have somebody else. We have several. I haven't called their names. I don't see their faces. They're out working in other areas. But the thing that it, 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 you have to understand is they have got to have some musical ability if you ever want that uniformity, okay? I didn't mean to spend so much time, but sound is a, is a problem in most churches. And it, just, just be prepared that it always will be. We, we've got a beautiful church here, but we have sound trouble all the time. Don't we, don't we know one? And, and Nolan's always wanting to spend more money. I mean, it's just the way it is. And it's just there's always something that would make it sound better. You know, they really. Because most churches are not built for sound. They're built for pretty, and then sound is added later, as in the one you're sitting in. It's a lovely sanctuary, but they didn't think about the sound when they built it. Else they would have never put this roof on it. Beautiful to look at, dumb sound mistake. I'm sorry, it's just true.
But unfortunately, the people in charge of choosing how the, how the building will be built are usually more concerned about it being decorated real pretty than sounding good. And then they're the very ones who sit in the worst seats in the whole church and complain that it's either too loud or they can't make the words out. Don't sit right there if you don't like loud. It's going to be loud right there. Don't sit over there if you're hard of hearing and you want to get the clarification because you ain't going to get it over there. But would you believe that some of our most standard members of this church sit right over there and they don't hear good? And the only thing we can do to change that would be to get rid of these goofy flying speakers and set a column that went from floor to ceiling of speakers turned every which way like you would do at a rock concert. You ever go to a rock concert? It sounds great. You know why? Because you paid eighteen fifty or twenty five or thirty bucks to get in and it better sound great because they ain't worried about the glory coming. They're worried about the music coming. You paid, you better hear. Right? Oh, to the day that we get to where we build our churches that way. That we make it sound good first and look good later. Okay? Because we're all creative enough to make it look good after the fact. All right? That was my two cents. That was my soapbox I just got off of. Glory. But so that means if you're a pastor and you're building a church here, will you please think? Okay. Think and don't complain afterwards. But let me tell you, even in the best of situations, sound, sound's going to be a problem. Because it just always is. It is in studios. Okay, let's keep moving. Let's do another song. Something about Jesus. Uh, a good, that was kind of a, well, I don't know what you call that group we just did, but that was just a group. <laughs> uh, let's, let's do something that people like, especially if they're Caucasian. Kind of a two-beat country thing. Not really country, but it's kind of a two-beat thing, and that's where all of us Irish descendants know how to, we can dance on the one and the three. We ain't too good on the two and four, right? A happy song. Now, let me show you how to make this real easy to play. Two, three, and... starts with Benny doing a harmonica and I have to play key bass so we won't do it that way because some of y'all don't have key key bass players and you don't have harmonica players uh, but when I'm doing a keyboard like that my intro is it's an F it's an F and the, the most wonderful revelation you'll ever find in your life as a keyboard player is to realize F can be played several different ways instead of first inversion If I played it first in version all the way through, it'd sound like. Okay? Instead, play the third inversion of it and play it in octaves. So all that means, the first inversion would be F, A, C, F. Second inversion would be A, C, F, A. Third inversion would be C, F A C. That's where I play most songs on the third inversion. And on a song like this, it's a guitar song. It's not a piano song. So you need to play it like a guitar player. And a guitar player is not going to play the A. He's going to leave the third out of the chord. I drop the A down to a G and make it a two chord. So it's a C F G C. Now don't this sound better? And I'm not moving on the right hand. I mean, listen to this. I mean, I'm, I'm literally, and keep in mind, I'm playing a C, F, G, C. Do you know I'm moving one finger on the right hand, the whole chorus? Listen.
I'm letting up on the G. That's all I'm doing. What's making it sound different is the bass that's descending. See, the bass is going F, E, D, B flat. But I'm still playing that. That's all I'm doing. Ain't that easy? I believe I can do that. And the intro is the same thing. I'm rolling off of the, I'm playing that same inversion of F, and I'm rolling off the F, G. And it goes. It's a God and insult of how you save my soul. I mean, that's all I'm doing the whole song through. I can, like, I can go into some spiritual mode and never know I'm in the, in the whole song because he's carrying all the rhythm. And Scott is playing this. What, what are you playing? There's a two-beat thing, aren't you, Scott? It's a... He needs a mic. He needs a mic. Yeah, Bill... Where'd that mic go? This is a variation on what we call a two-beat. Two-beat is just your typical... Uh, then there's something we call a rockabilly, which is this. Where you, where you play single strokes on your snare drum and it kind of keeps this kind of a train feel. But since Happy Song is kind of a two beat shuffle, you have to shuffle those eighth notes. So instead of that, 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 you've got to go that, 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 that. Does that make sense, all you drummers? So check it out. It does sound like a train. Yes, it does. When I think of happy, I think of trains. <laughs> well, fun. And that's it. All right, now, Glenn, tell us that real complicated, worth our money part you're playing. <laughs> All right, here's the deal. When I started playing guitar, I found out it was a very uh, difficult instrument. And um, the, the best players, watching other players play, they, they made it look easier because, like, we don't have two hands to do all this kind of stuff. So I realized the concept of something called a common tone, which is a note or a chord that can be played over most of the chords. Hmm. And so that way, you know, guitar is weird because you have to, you know, learn all these different chords and play them in different, you know, changes and stuff like that. So if you can keep your hand in one place, and find all the chords you need in one section of the, of the neck, then uh, you'll live a longer life. So, um, so basically, this is it. And the concept of that is that this note is over the whole section, so I can kind of keep that going. From there, I can just kind of change it and make it busier, you know, and add to it from there. But that'll, that'll make it easy on you. So that's... Oh, they want to see. You're hiding. All right, here's my rock star pose. Ready? <laughs> If you're in a church where you don't have this many musicians, you can still do happy song, but the piano player has to work harder. If it's a piano player, if it was if it was a guitar player, Glenn, is there a way to give us an idea if there were not a keyboard player how you would play that song? I'd probably just use the same position, just play a little bit more. Got it. Wait. What's your question? 
the sound, the, to get the sound, here comes the gear question. Um, it's the, the second notch of the five position switch, the, the, you know, the classic strat, whatever that, uh, that would be bridge and middle. And it's just a clean sound with a little bit of compression on it. Dry. Pedal. Right, one of those little pedals you got down there? Compressors? Okay. All right, that's, do you see what I mean? He's playing different, he's playing alone. If I'm playing with the band, all I'm doing is... And I'm literally moving one note through the whole thing. Now, if I were playing that without the band, and we were going to do Happy Song, it would be more like... I would just put more rhythm in the left hand, like... You know what I mean? I just create my band, because if I don't have them, I don't have them. But see, that will get boring. It's more important when you're a solo instrument to use dynamics than it is when you're with a band, even. Because if I start off here... I don't have anywhere to go. So I would probably start off... And when I opened it up, I'd have some. I got somewhere to go, you see what I mean? The problem is, is if you go with all you've got in the beginning, you ain't got no gas to finish the drip, you know what I mean? And you can't, cre you can't create that, that, that feeling where it's going somewhere and people keep coming with you. That's consequently a problem. I don't have that problem singing because I don't know that many licks, but when you're really a great singer, especially a gospel singer, a lot of black gospel, you know, they have, <laughs> I'm amazed, the licks they can come up with in a song. Uh, we white folks don't have that problem. We have about three, and that's what we do. Uh, but, but one of the things that I think is very distracting about worship leaders that I see, black or white or Asian or Hispanic or Indian, whatever you are, is the need to prove how great a singer you are when you're leading worship. You just sing licks everywhere. Yeah, 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 I could sing in his own yeah, yeah, you see my, my soul. Now there's a time when you're doing a gospel song that that's right. You know what I mean? When, 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 when someone of color, preferably, grabs the microphone and sings a, over a rubato piano piece, and they go into all that, it, it's appropriate. But on that song, we don't need to hear how cool you can sing. Because the other thing I want to recommend is, now, Gary Oliver is a dear friend of mine. I know him well. He's a freak of nature. <laughs> and I am really sick of hearing Gary Oliver clones. He's a white boy, but somewhere, back somewhere, something got mixed up and the boy can pipe. But the problem in that area, even with Gary, and he's my dear friend, is in a worship setting like what we're in this week, it becomes a distraction sometimes because the man can sing so high. It just keeps going up. And, and I was with a worship leader friend of mine who was doing that a, a while back, you know, and it was, he got to the third key change and the rest, rest of us just stopped singing and just listened to him go because we couldn't go there. As a worship leader, I'm not here to prove I can sing a lick, okay? If you're gonna sing a solo and do your groove thing, then get yourself a record deal and just go do it, baby. But worship time ain't it, okay? Now, there are times I look over at Johnny because there's something in Johnny's voice that's so powerful that I just say, Johnny, go for it, and Johnny will just belt. And it's like his spirit cries out to God. And that's okay. But I don't want to hear Johnny belt on every song. It's not appropriate on every song. And besides, you're not going to worship. You're just going to sit and listen to Johnny do stuff you can't do. And we get back into performance. We get back into, it's not pulling me into worship, it's causing me to spectate. And that's what we don't want to do and create. Okay, let's, uh, anything else there? Anything else there? Yes, tell me your question. Hold on, 
Hold on, let me get you this one. This sounds good. Most of the music now is being written by a lot of guitarists, and it's very simple in its chord structure. How, as a pianist, can you keep from getting bored? I mean, you can change so many intervals, you can drop out. Like last night, there were some of the things that were just the same chord over and over. It's wonderful to sing by. As a musician, how do you keep from getting bored? Uh, that's an excellent question. What's your name? Deborah. Deborah. Deborah, that's an excellent question, and, and that's where I have to go back, and I don't say this in a, in a wrong way. Our time in worship corporately is not a time for us to fulfill our musical aspiration. Okay? That's, that's something we all have to rethink. Because there are certain songs God likes. He's got favorites. And unfortunately, we don't always agree. He's always right, but we don't always agree. Uh, for instance, and again, a dear friend of mine wrote this song. And I honor him and love him dearly. Andy Park wrote a song back in 1994 or 5 that entitled, We Will Ride. I didn't like that song when I first heard it. I didn't see the need to sing about a horse in church. <laughs> and even now, there's a certain thing in me when I sing it, I go, oh no, not again. But I'm telling you, it's scary how when I start that song, wherever I'm at, in the right moment, that God just comes. I don't know if it's just that he likes to hear people say, Lord, I'll lay down what I'm doing and go with what you're doing. It's that obedience factor in that song, or it's just time. God loves that song. And every musician I know doesn't like it. Don't like to play it. Don't like the song. Don't like the groove. But what's so funny is God does. So again, I'm here to serve, Deborah. I'm here to serve. And, and yes, that's one of the major hurdles I had to get over in the beginning of revival. Because it's boring to play as a musician. But that's where you move away from being the player and you move into the worshiper. And you go, this is to worship. And if, if I can write some songs that are a little more complicated, I would. But there's always a problem with complicated worship songs is they get over into a situation where people cease to participate and they start to spectate. And so I, do I think that we shouldn't sing complicated songs in church? No, I don't. I think it's fine. I think if you do a choir song that's a little more complicated, I think opening songs can be complicated, uh, you know, that kind of just get your flesh engaged. I think that's okay. I think if you go out and sing in a venue somewhere and you do a concert, it's fine. I think your church probably to help your worship leader who thinks he's Gary Oliver get it out of his system. Once a year, you ought to have a concert, you know, and just let him sing every lick he has and just get it done. Or go make a record and just get it out of your system and come back and lead us in worship instead of frustration. Now, many of you are going to discount that. You're going to say, well, you're just saying that because you can't do it. I wish I could do it. But I know that this place in time of corporate worship is not the time. And I catch myself over singing sometimes. I do. I catch myself. One of the things I despise about myself sometimes, Jesse, is I get so excited about it and full of it in my spirit that I get in that habit of feeling like i got to keep going. All right, come on, come on, come on. And sometimes you need to. But... It can be a habit. It's a crutch. You're looking for an emotional button. Guess what? Sometimes you'll sing, and there needs to be dead air at the end of it. When the song ends, everybody doesn't need to cheer. Everybody doesn't need to respond. There may be songs you feel like they totally die. It's okay. Quiet is good. Can I say so? Yes. Um, one thing I, pertaining to your question, one thing I noticed about Lionel that I thought was really interesting was... Um, Vineyard, most of the vineyard writers are guitar players. They maybe have two guys who write keyboard songs. And when Leno started playing vineyard type songs, which really only had three or four chords in them, rather than, uh, than uh, him being frustrated with it, you found a way to work with it. Like you started using a, a keyboard patch that sounded like an acoustic. And he started developing a style that maybe wasn't familiar with, with yourself. 
but he, I, I saw it progress. He changed, he changed his style completely to be able to accommodate songs that were written on guitar, which I thought would be really cool if you could demonstrate the acoustic thing that you do. Sure. Just obey God. That point. I hated, hated Vineyard for that very reason. I never listened to it. I have a lot of respect for what God was doing there. It didn't suit my taste. And even though as a worship leader, you don't always please yourself, you got to find a way to get your button turned on or you're not going to help anybody else out. You know what I'm saying? And part of what Lendl did was instead of not changing the harmonies as much, but rhythmically, he took it into a direction that maybe because he was a keyboard player, but he added some feel to it that made it a little bit more appealing to a more rhythm-based thing. Um, of course, he's got black gospel kind of roots that he does, and he has that whole cool gospel thing. So he kind of pulled it in that direction, and he found a way, this is exactly what Glenn said, he found a way to make it interesting for himself. The beautiful thing about three chords is that it's a great thing to be able to do free worship over. So find out, and free worship can last for two hours with three chords. Find out how to make those interesting to yourself. For me, the rhythm that he added to the vineyard stuff pulled me right into it. And I was able to experience a depth in worship that I had not experienced because it, it made it more palatable. Okay. Well, I, I tried out first using, <laughs> they're, they're bragging on me and I don't know how to act. Thank you. I just feel Bless my heart. I had to start with a, 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 a rolling module for the, the guitar sound, and it never was really good. But I didn't have, again, I came into a traditional assembly of God church. And, you know, it was more piano organ based. And uh, really, the drummer followed the piano player, which is always a disaster especially when she's more of the traditional style because they kind of get that, the, especially AG piano players, they get that feel going. It's like... I mean, it's like... Whoa, whoa. One day Scott was leading, was playing with a worship leader that kind of had that, that wave on the ocean kind of tempo. And he finally, out of frustration, came up to me and he didn't want to approach the worship leader said, could you just find out if they want me to follow them or if they want me to set the tempo? Because in all of honesty, there's no way to follow that. Because the drummer will be going, ting, ching, ting, ching, ting, ching, ting, ching, ting, 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 ching, ting, ching, ching. You know, you just can't do that. The drummer is there to set the cadence. And Grandma Mabel at your house, at your church, needs a metronome. You know, she's just going to have to learn to get the waves calmed on the ocean. Tell her, Jesus, Jesus, calm the sea, you know. And if, if you can't get her to do it any other way, just tie one of her hands behind her back. Because she can't do that thing with only one hand. She can all she can. Okay? But one of the things I did, I, I found that I'm not selling cord. They should endorse me, but they won't. Um, I love their, their keyboards because they're simple. And I, I, work, I work basically no-brainer kind of stuff. I'm not real bri brilliant, and I'm not a manual reader. Uh, but I took the Chord Trinity, and there's a sound on it called New Set of Strings. And it's got, it had a piano, it had a, a, a string pad under it, and I went in and tweaked with it and got rid of it and took a lot of the effects off of it. But there's still some there. And it, and it translates a real decent... And see, that sounds totally different there instead of here. And, and I tried to listen to acoustic players play on those vineyard records and realized that most of the time I needed to drop the third and play the second. And I need to play open chords most of the time and, and not do a lot of moving around and not play real full stuff like I had been used to. Like, I mean, not all that stuff, you know, because that don't sound good on guitar because a guitar player hadn't got that many fingers. You know, he can only catch three or four of those notes and then he's dead. So, and I found that, that it's good for creating, like uh, a lot of times I... And see, on the records, I've actually had people go, that sounds like a guitar, but it's not. It's me on a keyboard. 
He has fire in his eyes. And another thing that I love to do is take the JV Roland modules. They have really great warm sounds. They have sounds like that or this one. It's kind of a dark sound, but seeing by itself, it kind of, kind of, you know, you, you go, worship drowning. It's like, but then when you put it underneath the guitar sound, it, you get. as opposed to. You see, it just fills up the room a little bit more and it makes it real. And again, you notice how that, that just that, that, all that is is a C chord with no E in it. And I'm playing a D instead of E. Do you notice how it starts to create an atmosphere? Just, and that is so easy to do. It's all in the rhythm is a groove I mean immediately from the first note and it gets you into you quit thinking about the music and it just takes you into a groove and immediately as a musician you start hearing a song and it may be that song or no other song but he establishes a mood in the groove and that's so important for good worship whether he has his rhythm section or not and then everybody else comes in just builds on top of that it really helps of course listening to your James Taylor records helps out too That's bad, isn't it? I'm sorry. But those kind of guitar things, as a piano player, it's, it's, it's interesting to try to emulate them, you know? And it's in, it, listen to the voicing and try to, try to emulate it. It makes it different. Because we didn't have that as an Assembly of God church. We didn't have somebody. That, Benny is an awesome, sickening, awesome acoustic. I, I hate people who can play everything. He plays great acoustic guitar. And... But if I'd have had him play acoustic guitar, he wasn't playing bass. And so I figured he plays better bass than I do on the left hand. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, another thing, too, let me say this, too. Have you, got, have you got a church where you have a difficult time getting bass players? You know, a lot of times that's hard. Uh, something that I did in my home church, and it works, and it takes some dexterity, and it takes some practice on your part. And again, it's back to playing simplicity and working on your rhythm. I started as a drummer, so it helps me a little bit. But uh, what I wound up doing was playing, um, was playing key bass, and I would just dedicate a keyboard. My machine ain't playing along with me. Come on now. Um, I would dedicate a keyboard to strictly a bass sound and put it through a bass amp. Like... And then you, but then you have to listen to music thinking, okay, if this is going to play the rhythm, so like, uh, like if we were to play We Will Ride, just me and Scott, this is only two musicians. But I, go, you're going, I could never do that. But y'all, I'm not that awesome of a keyboard player. I've just done this a long time. And you go, I couldn't word worship and do that. Yes, you can. Because you're doing the same thing you're doing on the keyboard anyway. Like if you were just playing piano, you'd, you'd be playing. See, this is just me and Scott. And he's calling out. It's not as good as Benny, but it's a nice fake off, isn't it? And you can always go anywhere you want to go because you know where you're going. Unless you get in two keys and then you got a problem. <laughs> but you see, there are ways around having limited players, but it takes some, some thinking on your part. And a lot of you are going, I could never do that. But again, if you'll approach it from a simple standpoint, 
you know, and, and, and try to work on interest, making interesting the simple things you know how to do. You know what I'm saying? Instead of trying to play all this, you know, just make it like this and make it simple. Okay, let's do another one. Y'all going to input, 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 input? Yeah. Ah, that's good. Okay. Bass players here. Raise your hand. Bass players? Drummers? You all are the foundation of the band. Totally. And one of the most horrible things you'll ever hear is a bass player not listening to the drummer. It's only... The only thing that's worse is a worship leader who is a drummer. <laughs> I'm kidding. There, there are some good... Scott, could you just give us a little piece of, of a worship leader that's the drummer, too? Just, just singing a little bit of maybe, I love you, Lord. I'll hold your mic for you. Don't act embarrassed. This is, this is when you're <laughs> the worship leader. You ready, brother? Here we go. Here goes. This is a very bad drummer and a very bad worship leader. And you're the only person at the church. I hope everyone else thinks this is as funny as you do, because <laughs> if they don't, this is a real waste of time. Lord, I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. with that drummer somewhere. <laughs> Benny, can you give us some examples, you and Scott? <laughs> I just think that's funny. I'm sorry. Can you give us some song examples that would, that would, what, what are you trying to do with the drummer most of the time when you're listening to him? Uh, the first thing I guess would be, um, Looking at the song, I, I tend to take songs in sections. Even if it's, even if there's a, if Lisa writes a legitimate chart, you can usually still. When, on that rare day, <laughs> she write, when she writes a real chart, you know, you can still find sections in the song that characterize that part of the song rhythmically and harmonically and dynamically. And then the drummer, hopefully, um, which with, with Scott, that's, it's, it's an easy, it's a no-brainer because Scott just falls into to doing that. So he's, um, you know, he's going to do something in a section that characterizes that section with his kick drum usually and with his hand patterns, you know. And um, once we establish what that is, then I have to decide uh, if I can, uh, if I'm going to play his kick pattern or if I'm going to do something that, resembles his kick pattern that sort of ties the rhythm in with the with the harmony of the music you know so do we want a lot of energy do we want a little bit of energy do we want it to feel like um, that you're just kind of walking around in circles thinking about something or do you want a lot of forward motion to sound very deliberate do you want uh, long notes short notes decide how long your notes should be and how energetic it should be that sounds like a lot to think about. it's a lot it's, very tiring just to <laughs> one of the things one of the things that Benny's saying that you need to pick up on as drummers is drummers fail a lot of times to lock into patterns and if you know that's one of the staple problems young drummers have with their kick like sections of the songs you establish a pattern and you do that not only to establish it but you do it so the rest of the players know what's going on and once they figure out what you're playing, then the bass player can lock into what you're doing. But if you're sporadic and you're playing, for four bars you're playing one pattern and four bars you're changing, you know, unless you're really tuned into the Holy Ghost, the bass player is not going to be able to discern what you're doing and it will never have a cohesive sound. Uh, can you guys give us an example? Just do a country rock kind of thing. Like what? Um, Bom ching ba bom ching bom chat. Keep 
talking. I can change that up. I can make that feel sound different or feel different by lengthening and shorting notes. So that's like a muted note. Play it muted. Is that muted? Notice how it has a little bit more of a rhythm to it, and all he's doing is shortening the notes he's playing. Now, make it drive for me. How would you make that groove drive? Short notes. Notice how it just changed. Now, play long notes. So with three, just three examples of the same thing, the drummer's playing the same thing, but all three times, just what the bass player plays changed the character of the song. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's more to playing bass than just one note at a time. He's actually choosing what the mo mood of the song will be. Okay? Any more questions on that? I'm trying to just make sure we get everybody satisfied. Singers are going, what did we come here for? I, <laughs> they're having a great time. It's what they always do. They sit while the band rehearses. <laughs> um, let, I tell you another thing that we could talk about is guitars, because everybody usually has too many guitar players. And, and usually, Glenn, I've noticed something in worship teams, their guitar sounds are so aggravating. They're, they tend to get, a, if y'all know what I'm talking about, it's like you get a God help you if the guitar player figures out how, where the distortion pedal is, and it sounds like a cat with his claws on the blackboard, and you're just going, oh, oh and no wonder grandmother, grandmother Hoot and Doodle don't like it. I mean, it's just abrasive, and it's just making you want to pull your hair out. And, you know, if we were all teenagers, and we were all, you know, slam dancing in, in the mosh pit, it would be okay. But something about wor the worship service, you've got such a variety of ages in there, and they don't really get into that, but there's a way to make a distorted guitar, and I think Glenn is probably the best I've heard at that, making it sweet. So, it, Well, that, that's nice of you, but I just want to clarify that the mosh pit is where the action is. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want the action, hey, stay out of the pit. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was one of those abrasive guitar players for a long time, and, and it's like when, whenever I talk about this kind of stuff, I just think of all the worship leaders that, that kind of hung in there with me because guitars and worship leading are, it's just something that has to develop. You, it's just the weirdest thing. I, I don't even know if I could explain it, but I had some really good worship leaders who were patient with me. And uh, if you work with your guitar players and, you know, they'll become better over time, I hope, you know. And uh, as far as guitar playing goes, there's, there's no shortcut for good gear. You just, you gotta spend money. Uh, I mean, I wish there was another way around it. Dan Electro is making some really good stuff for not much money, so they've come out with a lot better stuff than 10 years ago. Um, it's an ear thing, you know. All guitar players hear music differently, and, and if, if guitar players listen to the actual song that's being played, you can find an appropriate part. If, if most guitar players I notice are just staring at their hands the whole time and they're not really f listening or focusing on what's going on, for me in worship I find it easier to watch the worship leader almost all the time because you can, you can focus on, I mean that's, that's what's going on, the worship leader is leading people in worship, it's not really about what we're doing up here. So that was like the first thing and the next thing is listening to the song and playing a part that's appropriate. Most guitar players just, just want to turn on the distortion and solo and, you know, play all the fun stuff. So a lot of it's not fun. A lot of it is uh, discipline. And boring sometimes as a musician. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I've sort of, uh, maybe I'm getting old, but I, I, some of the funnest times are when I'm not playing. I, I just, I'm starting to really enjoy kind of sitting around and watching these guys play. I mean, I love watching Bill play. It's like one of the greatest things because uh, the B3 is just the coolest, the coolest instrument. It's Ark and, of the Covenant. Yeah, and, and 
But Bill's awesome. You guys have got to check him out. He's he's one of the best. He's one. He's literally one of the best I've ever seen. Absolutely. And the Leslie is really cool because the Leslie like an effect that come. You know, the B3 is made up of all these different incredible sounds, like a hundred switches and. You know, I, I just I just try to buy boxes that sort of do what the Leslie does, so I have fun watching. I find things to amuse myself when I'm not playing. All right, Scott, Scott, I didn't put it back there. I wanted to jump off something that Glenn just said. Um, uh, it's real easy to get into all the technical issues of, you know, what kind of drums do you use, what kind of pedals do you use, all the gear and those are important questions but I think everybody in the band would agree with me that the most important thing that any of you can do is to recognize that all of you are part of the worship team even though Lindell is up there and and he is the the person that everyone understands is kind of driving the ship um, we're all worship leaders every single one of you is a worship leader every one of you is a worshiper and when you get up in front and God has called you to lead his people into his praises, you are a worship leader. So everything that I'm playing from back here, everything Glenn's playing, everything Bill is playing, is all focused, or it had better be focused, on leading people into the presence of the Holy Spirit. If that doesn't happen, then what we're doing means absolutely nothing. The technical stuff, nothing. If, if it doesn't all boil down to what I'm playing, like last night when we got into that thing that, that Lila did, I was going to war. If something isn't happening, then it's, it's meaningless. So the technical questions are good. I'm, don't misunderstand me to be belittling that, but Glenn just said something that made me think that's an important point to make. We are all worship leaders, and we need to really take that role very seriously. Well, we just talked, I just talked to our music department about that. You know, every, in, every note you play needs to be focused. It's like I've got a purpose for playing this. I'm not haphazardly hitting these drums. I'm not haphazardly playing the bass or the guitar or just, just occupying a spot. You know, even when you're playing something that's not forward, like when, when Mike is over there and he's, or, or Bill or is back there playing second keyboard part, and it's not the pronounced keyboard part. People go, I don't want to play that. But you don't know what that's doing in the spirit. And that's what you have to do. You have to understand it has a spot that it's filling. And if that pl place is not filled, there's a hole. Let's take a couple more questions, and we need to let you get some rest. Uh, I want to make sure you come out of here with what you want to know, and if we can help. I can ask a technical question now. <laughs> okay. uh, I want to know more about your setup there. Do, same thing coming out of both your monitors, or is one keyboard and one vocals and whatnot? How many mixes do you have, okay. and what's the Mac keyboard for? Okay, I'm spoiled. Uh, so this is, not, again, in my father's church, this wasn't, wasn't the case. We had an upright piano, and most of the ivories were gone. So that's where I learned. So you don't have to have the best of everything, okay? But this will give you an idea uh, of what I've got. I've got a P300, Yamaha P300. They also make a P, they don't make the 300 anymore. This is a P200. I prefer the 300, but the feel on this is better, but the sounds aren't as good in my opinion. Uh, this is a P300. This is primarily doing piano. And it's got, uh, it's got piano sounds and electric so uh, piano sounds and it's got vibes <laughs> I know you're going to use that a lot uh, it's got some cheesy organ sounds yeah. strings kind of reminds you of the ARP in 1979 yeah, okay and it's got a bass sound an upright bass. I'm sure you're going to use that in your trio as you worship. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, hey, oh my soul. <laughs> Come on, little people, let's worship. Uh, So as you can see, I use it for electric piano and piano mostly. And I use the, um, the, the Trinity for, see, uh, these comes in 
the Trinity now comes in a great rack version. It's about a thousand bucks. It's, it's really a great instrument. I like to have a second keyboard up here because it, it responds better than this does. Like I can, and it's got an aftertouch where I can mash the key and get vibrato like. I can get that little thing going and it's an aftertouch effect. And it's got all kinds of little tricks I can play, but I can't do it through this keyboard. That's the reason I like the keyboard. I have a, 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 a Roland JV2080. I use that for like pad sounds that I, I mix together with this, but this is always doing piano. And uh, I, I, I use this more, the JV2080 as a color. It's a color instrument. I just add color to what I'm doing if I just get sick of a piano sound. Uh, this covers be bass when I need to do bass. It has great string sounds that I use sometimes. The Mackie is basically mixing all three of these and sending a stereo mix out to the main console. So if I need to adjust, uh, make a minor volume adjustment, I do it here because some sounds are louder than others. But I usually use the volumes on the actual instruments rather than mess with this a lot. But it gives, I've got like six channels because I'm running everything stereo. Like, I'm, like I said, I'm spoiled. I have a stereo monitor mix that's called Spoiled Brat. And, and I have these little guys in case, I use those in case these go down. Or I'll vice versa. This is a backup. This gets really loud, and my ears are not good at that. And I use a, a, a pack with ear things. And so that's kind of my setup and what I do. Um, you don't have to have all this to worship. It's, it's less wonderful if God lets you, but if you don't have it, you'll survive. Um, does that answer? Okay. I just want to, I, I, I know some of you need to leave. I just want to make sure. I know it's boring if it ain't your thing. I know. Just bear, again, forbear one another because there are some questions. Yes, ma'am. The question is, does the band and the worship team practice together or do we have separate practices? Brenda? Brenda is passing out. They're passing out those forms to you They'll now. Be at the doors. Excuse me? The, these forms will be at the door as they go out. Or okay, you as they go out. out. Well, they, you could pass them. The ushers could pass them while we're talking. Uh, Lisa, do you want to answer that question? Does the band rehearse with the vocals or not? There are times when we do both. For the most part, for the worship team, because our rehearsal time is at such a minimum, we um, have a little bit more rehearsal now than we did when I first came, but the worship team is lucky to get together once every couple of months. They really do an incredible job of carrying a huge load of music, just kind of picking up the parts as they go. Um, and they have been working with Lendl since the beginning, and because of that, have learned all of his repertoire and have learned his style of leadership. But what we do right now is we, with the worship team, we rehearse the choir separately, and they have their own separate rehearsals, but they will usually, because of time constraints, and because a lot of times Lendl doesn't know far out enough in advance what he's going to rehearse, yeah. we will put, we'll bring the band and the worship team together at the same time, and while the band is woodshedding something, we'll real quick just make sure the singers have their parts, and while the band is kind of playing along, they'll be humming along, and, uh, and it takes very flexible worship, uh, worship team singers to do that, people who are kind of willing to go the extra mile and not always look the best because nobody's spoon feeding them their parts but the other thing that that does is it makes them more independent and uh, not so reliant on you every time these guys don't really need a vocal director because they've had to operate so long uh, without a lot of help so um, but they usually practice with the band periodically we will pull together a separate vocal rehearsal when there's some real um, which thing that needs to be done, but very rarely. And they're neglected mostly, and they're very kind. I love you very much. They really are, because I'm looking at the overall experience of worship, and I'm realizing that if I have a singer who's singing the wrong part or the wrong song or the wrong lyrics, it's not going to be as severe with everyone singing along as if I've got a bass player on the wrong note. So I kind of make a priority there, and they become a second priority, not because I think they're less important, but also because I trust them that they will even, when they're uncertain, will sing something that's at least in the chord. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing. And then when we get together, when we do records, we actually rehearse. Uh, is there any...
my question is for any of the singers, actually. Um, I come from a church where there's a soprano and an alto backup. I'm the alto. The soprano is very strong, very powerful voice. I am not. At home, I can be. Um, I just want to know how to break that shell and how to come out so that I can blend with her. If anybody can help. Hmm. Takers, takers. You don't sing as loud as the alto. She does at home, she says. You, she's the alto. Oh, you're the alto. The soprano is really powerful, and she, she kind of hides in her shadow when she's with her. Well, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe the soprano would be willing to pull back a little bit to give you courage. No, no. Well, then just go for it. <laughs> a lot of times, those kind of things are leadership issues. Who's your music director? Ah, that's handy. Well, you're sleeping with the music director. That helps out. <laughs> this this question's married, for right? Amber then. Okay. I find that that works really well when you're sleeping with the music director. You <laughs> oh, it's his sister. Oh, that's nasty. Oh, ouch. Ouch. Oh, that sounds like a family triangle. You know what? And one thing that I've learned about singers is more is better. A lot of times, like typically we've got a soprano that sticks out in every choir that I've ever been in. Everybody knows who she is but her. And, um, <laughs> it's, and she's never Ooh. at the rehearsal where you're dealing with those kind of problems. She's never there. And, um, but if you will get some more singers, uh, peer pressure is a wonderful thing. Just about the time everybody turns around and goes, <laughs> then they start to get a clue and, and it backs off. Um, if you can even find two or three other singers to get a little bit more of a group thing there, instead of focusing on the problem, have a party. It's a lot more fun. You get a sense of community going and you've got some other people for her to rub up against. That's how, that's how. It cool. also helps sometimes, Lisa, I've found, and, and you know too, with the choir, you know, they can be like a pack. It's, it's like throwing a wounded fish into a bowl of piranha. Because if you've got a bad singer in your section, the rest of them are going to kill them. I mean, they just will. Because they realize that that person's making everybody sound bad. And then you've got to really get to a place where leadership has to come in. And you have to go sit down with that person who loves the Lord with all their heart, but can't carry a tune anywhere. And you got to decide, A, does this person really feel this is their ministry? Can we do something to improve them? Or B, is put them on the very end of the row away from a microphone next to the oldest lady in your choir who's deaf in one ear. Or the ultimate, if, it's, if that voice is so grating, kind of a, a Edith Bunker kind of that just is awful and sticks out, then what you've got to do is you've got to walk up to that person and say, God bless you, I love you, but your voice, I've tried to work with you, I've tried to get you help, and you're not getting any better. And I love you, again, it's loving them and them knowing it. Can I help you please try to find another ministry? Because this one isn't yours. You know, I'm not saying you will never sing, I'm saying right now, it's painful and you're you're going and i'm doing this for your own good because the alto section will stone you if you don't stop you know yes ma'am um what do you do with someone that has a real bad warble so much so that even when they're in the congregation people next to them can't really hear the melody and um you know we're at a, a new beginning a new church and conversations with a worship leader, you said, take anybody, but sometimes that can be fatal. Can, <laughs> can, a, can a warble ever be straightened out? Uh, it, the age has something to do with it. Is she an older lady? Well, you're, that she's your own lady then, is she? Uh, Lisa? Who had a wobble? Yeah, vibrato. Um, wow. <laughs> My vibrato is, can range pretty uh, wide sometimes, and so I have to be really conscious to straight tone sing a lot more 
than you would typically. And so the person has to recognize it themselves a lot of times, or if somebody can in love, go and tell them. You know, try to, try to you know, straight tone sing a little more. There's certain songs that especially need straight tone singing. And Lisa, you know, she'll tell us when, you know, this is, you know, get the vibrato out, you know, no vibrato. And, and it's a conscious thing. You really have to uh, set in your mind, okay, no vibrato, no vibrato. And then you'll catch yourself, you know, just about to go there. And so it's, it's, it's very hard to retrain yourself. But it can be correct. It can be correct. Even that jackhammer vibrato. That <laughs> you ever heard that? Oh, I love you, Lord, and I live. Mr. Ed. My boy. And that's the worst one to me. It's like, whoa, hell is this? But again, straight, if you can help her somehow, if she's a person you can talk to, to explain it, have her practice straight tones. Like, ah, ah, ah with no, ah, 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 You know, and sometimes it sounds like you're trying to start a lawnmower or something. It's really, We've I know. Hit on, two, on two issues here. First of all, with lack of leadership, the people perish. <laughs> Um, if there is not a standard of nurturing, if it's just the kind of thing where it's a small church and you're just kind of throwing together a group and there's not really any leadership, you're going to have to deal with what you're going to have to deal with when there's no leadership. Yeah. But when there is leadership, it's a pastoring issue just like anything else. You are there to nurture vocalists and you are a problem solver. That's your job even more than anything else. Um, and don't be afraid. I learned this from my husband. There is a time to just say no. There is a time to go to that person and say, you are not able to respond or whatever the situation is. Don't be afraid to do that. Okay. I see a lot of folks are leaving. You're starving. And uh, we need to let you go. But I, I, I wanted to make sure, and I, there were probably questions we're not going to get to. Could you do me a huge favor and, and write those down and include them in tomorrow's session? And tomorrow morning, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to take okay, questions. Everybody will be here, all the players, all the singers. And so if you didn't get the question in today, we'll get it in. I want you to get some lunch and get some rest because I want, I want while worshiping this tonight, I want you to be alive and ready to go after God. We're going to have a great time. God bless you. You can turn in the uh, mail, uh, to be put on the mailing list to any of the ushers tonight or any of the ushers as you're going out.